From Tehran to Tel Aviv to Gaza, people in the Middle East are speaking out about Trump's victory. Chris Mitchell has their reactions. Some journalists from Arab Gulf nations hail Trump's election as a victory for the moderate access in the Middle East. One wrote, President Donald Trump returned to the White House is a nightmare for the terrorist militias and a new hope for stability in the Middle East. This Saudi journalist said, Trump's victory is a victory for Israel in its war against terrorism. Trump has previously shown strong support for Israel, and he will continue this support, which could give Israel more freedom in its fight against Hezbollah's terrorism. Hezbollah leader Sheikh Naim Qassam, hiding in Tehran, remained defiant. We do not expect the end of aggression to be based on a political movement, and we will not beg for the aggression to stop. We will make the enemy demand an end to the aggression. Iran's currency, the rial, fell to an all-time low after the election, leaving some Iranians pessimistic about their future. 100 percent Trump will intensify the sanctions. Things that are not in our favor will be worse. Our economy and social situation will surely get worse. In Israel, many believe Trump's presidency will mean more reliable support from the U.S. It's a victory for all the American people, for all the Israeli people, and it's a victory that erases every word of anti-Semitism in the world. Good luck to him. All the best. We love him. Well done to him. Basically, the governments are considered to be as business, and he would be someone that could take care of business, so to speak as opposed to someone of Camila Harris. In Gaza, some hope Trump will end their suffering. I hope to God that he is a man of peace and finds a solution for us. Enough blood. You see how the streets have become. There is no house without a martyr, a wounded person, or a disaster in it. Meanwhile, some Israelis are protesting Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's decision to fire Defense Minister Yoav Gallant. In his farewell address to IDF troops on Wednesday, Gallant praised their unprecedented military achievements. We changed the balance of power in the Middle East, from Gaza to Tehran, from Hudaydah in Yemen to Dahaya in Beirut, in all these places. Things happened that had never happened before, and we set our enemies back decades. Also on Wednesday, Netanyahu spoke with President-elect Trump about Israeli security and the threat Iran poses to both their countries. Well, CBN Middle East correspondent Chris Mitchell joins us now from Jerusalem. So, Chris, how would the U.S.-Israel relationship be different now with President Trump? Well, I think you're going to see a lot of differences, uh, uh, Gordon. First of all, I think you're going to see more green lights instead of red lights or yellow lights uh, under the Biden administration. There's been a lot of red lights for the past year, like a limited arms embargo. Uh, I think Trump will likely enable Israel to win their wars decisively and as quickly as possible. You know, he said in his victory speech he wants to end wars. He doesn't want to start wars. I think we're going to see the Abraham Accords back on track. Perhaps that would mean normalization with Saudi Arabia. I also think the U.S. is going to be providing more diplomatic cover for Israel in international arenas, like the U.N., International Criminal Court, International Court of Justice, uh, probably prevent sanctions on individual Israelis, as the Biden administration has done. Uh, one other thing, put the Oslo Accords to bed and probably offer another solution. One possibility might be former U.S. ambassador to Israel, David Friedman. You spoke to him about his proposal in the, his book, One Jewish State, to declare sovereignty over Judea and Samaria. So, in essence, I think it'll be a completely different direction. Uh, what do you think the future of UNRWA will be under uh, Trump's ad administration? In his past <clears throat> time, he, he stopped U.S. funding. Uh, Biden famously restored that funding. Uh, are we going to see uh, not just elimination of U.S. funding, but an attempt by the U.S. at the U.N. to stop UNRWA? I think that's exactly probably what the uh, the administration has been doing. As you said, they stopped fi uh, funding for UNRWA. I think they'll also stop funding to the Palestinian Authority, something that the Biden administration uh, began on uh, their first day in office. Uh, so I think UNRWA is going to really be uh, uh, put on notice for what, uh, what they have done with October 7th, their collusion with Hamas. It's been documented. Many of their uh, employees participated in October 7th. And as we have reported for years, 
that they really have indoctrinated generations of Palestinians to see that, uh, that all of Israel will one day become Palestine. So I think the funding will stop, and perhaps even trying to get UNRWA off the table and put it into another uh, UN agency to take care of the refugees. You said something very interesting just a minute ago, that the Oslo Accords would be on the table and, and there would be a, a restatement of that, a, a complete redo. Are you saying there, there might not be a Palestinian authority going forward? Well, you know, when in his book, and we talked to Ambassador Friedman just a few days ago at something called the Middle East Summit, uh, you know, the details have to be worked out. But the idea is that uh, Israel will declare sovereignty in his proposal uh, over Judea and Samaria. And uh, that would really that would really put the Oslo Accords to bed, that there would be a two-state solution, something that the Biden administration has been uh, you know, proposing time and time again, even after October 7th, uh, when Hamas did what they did, and also the Palestinian Authority, many people in, the, in that area were actually supportive of October 7th. So we could see dramatic changes uh, in whatever the Oslo Accords, they, they've been there for about 30 years and they haven't succeeded yet. Well, let, let's turn to Israeli domestic politics. Netanyahu fired his de defense minister, Gallant, on the eve of the U.S. election. Uh, is, is that timing coincidental? It, was he intentional? And, and what's been the impact uh, domestically in Israel? I don't think the timing was co coincidental. I think it actually fell on the election day uh, purposely, so it actually didn't get as much attention as it would have. Uh, the reason for that, uh, the, the firing, I believe, Gordon, was uh, Gallant had been considered by some to be insubordinate. Uh, there were significant differences on how to prosecute the war. And also, some believe, uh, Gordon, that he really was a back channel to the Biden administration and was undermining uh, some of Netanyahu's policies. Some believe whatever leaks have been coming out of the war cabinet will decline significantly right now. And, uh, and so, I th so the timing, I, I think, was purposeful. And going forward, you have to remember that in previous wars, the prime minister would also serve as the defense minister. They did that with Ben-Gurion. They did with that with the late uh, Menachem Begin. Right now, by law, Netanyahu can't uh, serve because he's under indictment. But he has somebody there as defense minister, uh, Israel Katz, who is considered very loyal to Netanyahu. Uh, but practically, Gordon, it might be that the Netanyahu would really serve as the de facto defense minister going forward in its multi-front war with Hezbollah, Hamas, and Iran. Uh, last question. Do you think Iran's going to follow through with their threat and, and now attack Israel and attack the U.S.? Is, the, is that still on the table, or do you think they're going to pull back? I think they're going to pull back. And I think that once uh, Trump was elected, uh, that served them notice that, uh, that Israel would have a, a robust ally on, uh, on January 2nd. So I really think that put a damper on their threats, which they have for the last couple of weeks, saying they're going to have a large-scale attack uh, against. That would be a rationale for not only uh, Israel to respond uh, in a large way, but also perhaps even under the Biden administration uh, to have U.S. support. So I think, uh, you know, Persians, as they often do, have strategic patience. They play the long game, and I think they're probably going to pull back uh, from their threats of a large-scale uh, attack against Israel. All right, Chris, thanks for this, your insights, and uh, uh, continue being the watchman on the wall. Thank you.